challenges of being a pastor on Sunday mornings is there is, uh, and it's not just me, this is actually true of all pastors here, uh, at least the United States, the way we do things, uh, you have a surge of details on your mind, and it's hard to keep everything uh, straight. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons, if you've ever wondered about this, why some pastors will not name names in a pastoral prayer is because you've got so many details going on, you, you, you drop some. And by the way, if you ever try to talk to me on a Sunday morning and I don't listen to you very well, <laughs> I'm sorry. I really care. I just am in detail overload and I don't always listen as well as I would like to on Sunday mornings. I just want it's worse on Sundays. <laughs> it's worse at on Sundays. Uh, now that's why a lot of times, can, can we talk this week? Uh, comes up, because that's where I'm trying to find myself where I'm a little more able to listen or better at listening. Uh, so, and I've thought about this, about being prayed for in a worship service. Uh, I, I, one of the reasons I do it is because my mother liked it uh, when our pastor did it growing up. Uh, you know, you appreciate your mom. Another thing, uh, I got sick on a Sunday afternoon when I was an associate at a church. Uh, fortunately, I wasn't preaching that night. But Elise came home that night and said, we prayed for you in church. It made me feel so good. I wasn't really that sick. But still, the act of being prayed for was so nice. I appreciate that. Uh, and so Don Thomas' daughter, Don Thomas, is uh, very active with our youth and is in the hospital right now. And she's sitting like right in front of me. We met this week, we prayed for Don. I mean, I'm so involved texting, but then I forgot Don. So Don, I'm sorry for you and your daughter. So let's have a word of prayer for Don Thomas right now. Dear Lord, we just thank you for Mama Don Thomas and her whole family and how good her daughters are at bringing people to church with them. They're just such great outreach people, appreciate them. And just ask you bless that whole family. And we especially pray for our daughter Don now with the problems that she's having this week. And just ask that you will bring the right people there in her situation to give her the need that she needs in the short run. And Lord, help us as a church to love her and support her so that we can be a part of your work in her life in the long run. Be with Dawn and Mia and Brittany and all the family here as they're concerned about their sister. Give them your peace and confidence that you're with them, you're holding their hand, and you're going to walk them through this entire situation you're going to carry them through the pain and bring them into a brighter day tomorrow. Lord, give them the grace to depend on you day in and day out. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And what did I do with my glasses? Uh-oh. No. Mm. Are, are, are those readers? Okay, this will work. Well, these are real good. I might keep these. Okay. Uh, turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Uh, before I do that, I normally have this three step routine I do before I leave my office on Sundays name tag, glasses, microphone. And I don't know how I skipped a step. But let's turn to Luke chapter 10. It's very. A very, very well-known parable of Jesus. Probably the, this and the prodigal son are the two parables of Jesus that are most well-known. Uh, but I think a lot of times we don't really go much past the surface. And I want to invite you to go deeper in the story. And as I've said before, see yourself in this story. And let God speak to us about how we should live. Verse 25. 
chapter 10 of the Gospel of Luke. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? The teacher answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind. Love your neighbors yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, he, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he, was tra as he traveled, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went, on, went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil on oil and wine. He then put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, Look after him, he said, for when I return I will reimburse you for any other expense I have. Which of these three men do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Thank you. The Good Samaritan. The story. The parable of Jesus. And it's a story about the human race. It's a story about you. It's a story about me. This is uh, continuing on. Tony, the pad has gone totally passive aggressive. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, moving into continuing with the sermon series starting this year, seeing 2020, seeing the world through the eyes of prayer, living into the vision of, the Mef of Chickasaw United Methodist Church through the eyes of prayer. We want to be connecting to Jesus, people to Jesus and each other. We want to grow deep and wide. We want to grow spiritually deep. We want to grow wide in our influence and outreach. And we want to inspire a spiritual legacy for everybody, those in our church and those outside of our church. And to live into that vision, there's a key part of that, and it is this, that we are called by God to be wounded healers. So let's give some thought to this idea here. That there is this question that keeps popping up throughout the whole Bible. It first shows up in Genesis 4 9, after Cain has killed his brother. God says, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, Abel, uh, Cain replies. Am I my brother's keeper? In other words, should I care about someone else? I have to take care of my brother? It is this question that's raised here. Does God care about people who suffer? Does God care about people who suffer? And you know the answer is yes. And then there, from that question comes this question. Okay, if God cares because I'm in the kingdom of God, do I need to care? Should I care? It comes up in a number of places, but I just want to highlight three. And the second one I want to highlight to you is from the book of Jonah. Jonah shows us that our actions matter to God and our attitude matters to God. You know the story about Jonah being told to go preach in the city called Nineveh. It was the capital city of their enemies. And he didn't want to go, so he goes on a boat and goes the other way. You know, he's thrown into the sea, he's swallowed by some kind of large fish and brought back to life. I would encourage you to read the second chapter of Jonah. That is his prayer inside the well. He never asked God to get him out. Just a thought, a little sidebar story there, to, something to think about when you need something to think about. Jonah and Nineveh is miles from the Mediterranean Ocean. It is not a seashore city. He walks or rides by a donkey a very long way. He preaches to the city. And I promise you, preachers want to be successful 
and he is very, very successful, and now he's mad because the people listened to him. His actions were right, but his attitude was sinful. Your attitude matters to God as well as your action. And this is something a lot of times we get wrong. We focus either on having the right attitude and your action doesn't matter or having the right action and your attitude doesn't matter. They both matter. And basically in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah is telling God, why didn't you destroy the city? That's why I came here to preach is so you could do this. And they repent and God forgives them. God says to Jonah, and should I not care, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also there are many animals? God cares about everybody in the world, even the sons and the daughters of the enemies, even the enemies, and their farm animals too. And then the wise teacher of the law. And that's one thing, when you become an expert in something, you become an expert in loopholes. <laughs> you become an expert in shortcuts. And this was a well-educated person speaking to Jesus who came across as a not well-educated person from that city of Nazareth, where it was sort of a servant community and he has spoke the law of Moses so very well but figuring that he could stump the country preacher and also figuring I know where the loopholes are and I'm going to point to the door he says and who is my neighbor and Jesus answers the question with this story. And so we're going to spend several minutes together breaking this story apart. I'm hoping we're going to, you are going to look at this story more seriously than you ever have before. It is my dream, it is my prayer that it will come alive to you and you will see yourself in all the characters. I think I double clicked. I did, yes. Who were the travelers? It says, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. They were all three going from Jerusalem to Jericho. The sea level drops 3,000 feet in that short distance. I, I didn't write that. I looked it up, but I didn't write down. Was, but it's not a too far distance. I think like 15, 20 miles, something like that. That is a, it is a major drop off as you go downhill to Jericho. They, were, they obviously had a reason to be going. They're not on vacation. This is not where you go on vacation. This has been, for centuries, a treacherous road to travel. It has a lot of large boulders, has uh, sheer cliffs and hairpin turns. It is a great place to get ambushed by robbers. It's kind of a road you don't travel unless you really need to go somewhere else. Try to, maybe a little bit of context for us. That's kind of like taking a shortcut through the Alabama village. But you don't usually do it unless you got somewhere you need to go. That's who they were. They were people of religious standing, at least the Levite and the priest were. And if the victim was dead, and they tried to help the victim, and they touched the victim, that's the only way you're going to be able to tell if the person's alive, is to touch them and giving them help. They would have then had to go back to Jerusalem to get cleansed again in the temple because there was a law against touching a dead body. And so whatever the reason they were going to Jericho for would be totally lost. And so they had to go, hmm, he's He's probably dead, so I'll just keep going. It says they crossed on the other side. And then there is this question that haunts us all when we see a need. Will I know how to help? Well, what will I do when I, when, I, when I get there? And then there is the question haunted their minds. They were people with reputation. Well, what if I'm late? 
People are going to get mad at me? Am I going to lose future opportunities because I didn't fulfill the obligation? Because I got sidetracked by this man on the side of the road. But let's think about the victim. He is unknown but wounded. When you tell a story, and I love telling stories, you know that. Uh, actually, I, I resist the urge to just tell stories many times in sermons. You know that. One of the things about a story is when you tell a story, you can control the details, and you can make the point of the story be whatever the point of the story is. And so Jesus says this is a made-up story. There was a man, when he said it, it is like, or there was a, there was a man with two sons. You can tell Jesus is going to parable mode. And I'm just of the opinion that he thought him up on the spot. Just That's just the way Jesus was. He was just that creative. And he says the man was a, a victim on the side of the road. Beyond knowing he was a man, you don't know anything about him. You don't know if he was Jewish or Samaritan, rich or poor, important or common, or, or, or on the margins of society. All you know is he's a human being and he's wounded. Jesus is being very, very intentional to us to say, take note, you don't have any social, cultural, or religious markers to notice this person. All you see it is a person who is a victim. I think what God was trying to say to us here is trying to say to us and will continue to try to say to us is this. See the victim as a victim because that's the way God sees the victim. There's so many other things we can put in our minds, but it is really, it is a victim. See it as a victim. Now I want to point you to a greater truth that the point of this parable is healing and not responsibility. If you want to put somebody on a responsibility guilt trip, this is the greatest place to start. The parable of the Good Samaritan. But with all due respect, if that's the way you feel, that's not the point. That's, that, that's superficial. Jesus is inviting us to go a little bit further. And let me just say this as a preacher myself. Some of the worst sermons I think I've ever heard have been on the Good Samaritan where the pastor or the preacher waxes eloquently about how we feel bad and we don't know who to help and how to help and all this stuff and just lays the guilt layer after layer after layer on the church and then says, well, I don't know. And it is. Jesus is way more dynamic than that. And I'll just share with you real directly that there are some people I refuse to help. I have a lot of compassion, but I, there are some people I just do not help. For example, the people begging for money on exit ramps. I've heard stories of how they work that situation to buy drugs. I've noticed people come by and pick up the money from the people on the standing there, almost like a bank. A courier comes by and gets the money. Uh, I had one uh, man who was homeless, he was a black man, and he pointed out that black people can't do that. Only white people can do that. I never thought about that, but he pointed out, oh yeah, you, you don't get a dime. I'm a black man. I'm like, really? I mean, like, like he had done it. I was like, wow. One of the turnoffs from me, and this is from loving homeless people. Homeless people have a unique smell. Yes, they do. When they come in your office, you immediately know. They don't have to tell you they're homeless. Usually they do, but I, don't, I wouldn't say it, but I think, what does it smell like? Clean clothes beggar, and beggars don't go together. Think of that. Clean clothes and beggars don't go together. God wants us to see the pain in this world because he wants you to be a part of the healing and he wants you to give to the wounded to create, create healing. Let me say that again. 
The point of this parable is that God wants you to see the pain in the world around you because he wants you to be a part of the healing that needs to go on. If God wants to give to the wounded of the world, but he wants to give through you, through me. That is a major, major change from a responsibility orientation to a healing orientation. God wants to use your life. God cares about people who are having difficulty. So what did both the Samaritan and the victim have in common? I'm going to go out on a limb right now, even though I never met the Samaritan. But judging from his actions, I'm going to say they've both been wounded. Nothing generates compassion more than knowing your own pain. Compassion should come from a feel of love, of identity with those who suffer, not from feeling superior to the person or feeling guilty about the way you have things. Over the years, I've noticed sometimes Christians will talk about why the youth should go on a mission trip. The youth should go on a mission trip so they'll know how rich they are. Let me say that's about the worst reason to go on a mission trip there is. I've been on a lot of mission trips here overseas and here in the States. You go and serve people because you love them. Not to feel bad about how wealthy you are. You go and you serve people because you know that fear, that pain, that uncertainty, that wishing you had it and you don't, and going to meet that need in another person. Why did this, and I'll talk in more in a minute here just about the, cement, the man seeing the victim, but why did he see, why did the victim catch his eye? It's because I think he identified with that feeling of being out of control. He identified with the fear, what's going to happen to me next? He identified with that this man had deep need and there's nobody here to help me out. He is the destitute person. And that's one of the drawbacks, even though I think it's really great to pursue it, but it is a, a huge drawback to both education and success. By achieving a certain amount of success or achieving amount of education, and I'm all about both, but there's this subtle deception that will tell you that you are perfect. And you're not. But because you've done this, you have it all together. And you, it's great. But you've got to realize there's a lot of brokenness in every single one of us. There's a lot of hurt and wounds and brokenness. And when you felt your own brokenness, and when you have allowed God to heal you, then you and I can be free to help others because we identify with the pain and we identify with the good things that God can bring to our life. Then you are free to help as a wounded healer. And I'm convinced that the wounded healers are the greatest healers in the world. Share a quick personal story. Actually, I'm not going to tell the whole story. I keep this uh, decoration in my office, given to me by a lady by the name of Doris Welch. I think she spent more on the frame than she did on making the crosses herself. But she gave it to me as a thank you gift. And I keep that to remind me because you know, I've shared the whole story. I'm not going to share the whole story today. I'm going to give you just two points here. I, I remember when her and her husband at the time came to see me. They were about ready to kill each other. And they came to me for marriage counseling. It did not go well. It did not go well. I still shake my head at that experience. But somehow after they split up, she looked me up and talked to me. And she found me to be an approachable person. Her stepfather was a very, very critical preacher. 
and was very mean to her, and she had never had a good conversation with the pastor before. And she had had more trauma happen to her than anybody I've ever talked to in my life. Stuff out of movies. Or actually, we wouldn't make movies about that. Nobody would go see them. It was too awful. But she found me to be approachable, and she found me to have had pain in my life and recommend a God who could heal her pain. And she did. She found the healing of God in her life. God wants wounded healers in his world. I think one of the things that holds us back, though, is when we see problems is all we see is problems. So in a cute way, I want to say this. The victim is half dead, but it also means he's half alive. Jesus said a man was going down to Jerusalem, Jericho, and he was attacked by robbers, meaning they were violent. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him in a left him away, leaving him half dead. They'd given up on him. They got what they want. And when the Levite and the priest walked by, they saw a man who was half dead, too. It won't do any good to try. Dear friends, not just us, when I say this sentence, I mean the whole human race. We give up too, too easily. We give up too easily on people. God does not give up on people as quickly as we do. Now, there's a really good news inside that sentence. God does not give up on you as quickly as you give up on you. Our God sees possibilities and potentials and opportunities where no one else sees it. I remember in a church leadership Bible study of a, another church years ago, we were talking about the, the vision of Ezekiel and the Valley of Dry Bones. And I asked, what do you see? And someone in the room said, I see our church dead. I'm like, wow, this is going good. <laughs> but I had the courage. And I had the insight to say, yes, it's a valley of death. Just skeletons scattered everywhere from a, a, a battle that was fought. But everything God needs to bring up an army is there. With the Holy Spirit working. Now, just a valley of bones is a valley of bones. But it became a great, great miracle. God sees things we don't. The robbers thought the victim was dead. The Levite and the priest thought the victim was dead. But that Samaritan, he seemed to see there's a possibility if I get my hands a little bit dirty, this could really make a difference. He saw a possibility where other people only saw death. The first two travelers are up and moving around. They call that in the hospital world ambulatory. Because they're spiritual dead. They were spiritually dead, but they felt no pain. There's an interesting word. We use the word ambulance, but uh, ambulatory. Learned that word a few years ago. A good friend of ours was uh, uh, in, in a hospital, had, had actually had lung surgery, and got out, and I texted, or actually it was back in the days of emails. I emailed a friend who went to see him, and she used to be a nurse, and I said, how is he doing? She said, he's doing good. He's ambulating. He's even ambulated in the yard. I thought, is that okay to say? <laughs> that means walking around. It means walking around. So I was really, whoo, ooh. So they were up and moving around, but they were spiritually dead. And you say, how do you say such a critical, harsh thing? They were spiritually dead because they felt no pain. When you're dead, you feel no pain. God is a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, yet feels pain. Now let me say to you, if you right now are going through a difficult time of life, God knows your pain, and in his great compassion for you, fills your pain with you. 
because he is alive and he is loving. But when a person stops being alive and loving, they feel no pain. Thought some this week about the topic of pain and what it means to us as people. We tend to fall in two deadly extremes in relationship to pain. We can become blind to pain, or we can drown in pain. You're in bad shape when you feel no pain, and I'm in bad shape when all I do is feel pain. Because between the two extremes, there's this great thing called possibilities. There's a great thing called possibilities. God sees the pain, God feels the pain, knows the pain, understands the pain, and yet he sees possibility there. And in the Bible is a story of God seeing pain and calling people to be a part of that. And a quick illustration of that is the life of Jesus. One of the biggest misconceptions that people have about Jesus and his earthly ministry is all that Jesus did was hang, at, hang around with the poor and the downtrodden and the mistreated. Some of you may have said that. I want to challenge you to read any of the Gospels. Pick one of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Luke, Mark's the shortest. And notice there is a flow to Jesus' life, but he just keeps getting interrupted. He just keeps getting interrupted. You could, uh, Jesus spends a lot of time coaching the 72 disciples and even more time coaching the 12 disciples. Think about this, y'all. And then he just keeps getting interrupted by people who had need. There is an overall flow to this. It's not totally random. It's been said you could title Matthew, Mark, and Luke they're called the Synoptic Gospels. The storyline is very laid out, very similar, called the Jesus' Journey to Jerusalem. And John, we could call Jesus kept going to Jerusalem. Because that is the flow of every one of the Gospels. He was going to Jerusalem. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law and heals everybody, it seems like, in the town. And the next morning, Simon Peter wants Jesus to stay in his hometown at his house because this is pretty cool. And Jesus says, no, I've got to go. we got other places to preach. And he leaves. There was definite human need, and Jesus moved on. Because Jesus had a mission, and there's nothing wrong with having a mission. There is nothing wrong with having an agenda as long as you get it from God. But your agenda cannot be so important that you can't be interrupted by people who are in need. That's the difference to this. You, you see that difference there? That he, Jesus was constantly being interrupted by people who had need and people who needed to be healed. So I invite you to Think about the story here just a second more. About if you were standing there listening, what would you think of the characters? Priest? Yeah, just like a priest. Levite? Yeah, that's what I expect. A Samaritan? Wait, what? A Samaritan? I thought about my world. What would this story sound like today for me? And um, I don't mind saying that uh, the people in, in, in our community that I have absolutely the most disdain for are drug dealers. If someone is involved in criminal activity, I call the police. As soon as I have evidence, put it over the law. They, they were scourged. I see what the addiction is doing to people and families and children, and it's just awful. But I was thinking that Jesus might tell this story about someone walking through the Alabama village and they get jumped and bricked and robbed and a pastor a lot like me passed by and a church employee passed by, but a drug dealer stops in his fancy Cadillac and has compassion on the man. 
bandages wounds the best he can and takes him to the hospital. That's the way it would sound for me. The person I didn't expect, and I don't know what it is for you, who that person is, but you need to try to see yourself in the story. Who would be that person to go do that? Put yourself in the shoes of those hearing. Why did the Samaritan stop? Because he saw the man. He didn't see a problem. He didn't see a responsibility or a guilt trip. He saw a human villain, a being. I, I don't want to make too much of that phrase, but it says when he saw him, he took pity on him. He, th there's seeing and there's not seeing, you know? <laughs> Just like there's hearing and not hearing. I had to eat lunch yesterday with a group of men. We said they all have hearing problems. It was really interesting. They all said they had hearing problems. At least their wives had diagnosed it. By the way, Jennifer, you might have some people look you up. Okay, so two of them are veterans. Uh, but there was, uh, you know, there's seeing and there's seeing. And this man saw. He took pity. Now this is a, this, real quickly, this is a little foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. He would be wounded. He would die. But he would be the one to heal us. Jesus would be wounded and die. He would be the one to give us eternal life. The dead man didn't stay dead so he could give us eternal life. That is an amazing, beautiful story. So to close out our time, I want to leave you with one question. Who is it that God wants you to see? Maybe you're already seeing them, and that's great. Praise the Lord. Or maybe there's pain in your world. God wants you to see not only the pain, but the possibility. I'm convinced that God wants to use every single one of us to stop, the, or at least reduce the pain in our world by caring about others and reaching out and believing there's a possibility to make a difference. God does, and God can, and God will. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the call on our lives to, to see pain, to see our own pain, and then see the pain in others, but don't stop with the pain, but to see the God who heals the wounded. Help us receive the, wound, the healing for the wounds we have in our own lives and help us also to care enough about others to help bring healing to others where there's woundedness in our world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Go, my dear friends, to be wounded healers. God bless you.